Hello, 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 hello. And thank you all so much for joining us this evening. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Tom Blute with Interabang Books. I'm the event manager for them. And I'm so delighted that we have the opportunity tonight and the honor, I should say, to host Jenny Bat with Each of Us Killers, as well as Jen Fox with Mannequin and Wife. We are so delighted to have these two incredible authors with us tonight. But before we turn the floor over to them, I want to touch on a couple small items. For those of you who are in the know, you might know that Interabang Books is a small independent bookstore located in Dallas, Texas. We have recently renovated our permanent location at 5600 West Lovers Lane, Dallas, Texas 75209. I wanted to reach out because folks might have come by and seen a lot of work and construction going on. We're, our doors are open to you. We would love to see you in the store with a mask, of course, covering the nose and mouth. We invite you to come on in and check out our, our books that we have in the store. You're also free to order your books online at interrobankbooks.com. We're happy to ship those books to you or bring them out to you curbside to keep everybody safe and happy and comfortable. You can also find out more about my upcoming events, much like this one, at interrobankbooks.com. you also see, if you're on Facebook, which you all are, because that's where you're watching this, uh, you can check out my events under my Facebook tab. And I'll say we are especially thrilled to have these authors, but we only have authors in part because we sell their books. Publishers don't send them to us otherwise. So keep an eye out. And as you enjoy and learn more about both these books, you can order them at the link at the top of this post. Go to that link. You'll see both the books and more information about the authors there. And you can order it, have it shipped to you, curbside pickup, all sorts of fun things. So I encourage you to do that right now. As we go through this event tonight, you can take a look at... Are, uh, you can hear everything, and then also you can drop your comments into the comment section below this post, and I will relay those to our authors. That way we have an excellent opportunity to correspond with everybody, even though we are all socially distanced and away from each other at the moment. I've talked for far, far, far too long. I am going to silence myself now and turn the floor over to Jen Fox. Jen, please take it away, ma'am. Okay, thank you, Jen. Um, yes, I, uh, my, my name is Jen Fox. Uh, I am thrilled to be here tonight with Jenny Bott. Um, my, uh, we both have brand new, brand spanking new debut short story collections in the world, both small press releases, or mine is a university press, same difference. Um, but uh, Jenny's book is Each of Us Killers. It's phenomenal, scorching. Uh, my book is called Mannequin and Wife. Um, it is, uh, came out on September 2nd. It is my first book. Uh, it's a collection of stories that I wrote over a period of about 11 or 12 years. Um, I am, let's see, a little bit about me. I'm a writer of literary fiction. I'm uh, really fun at parties. Uh, I can dance like the wind. No, um, I, uh, let's see, I've, I've published work in places like One Story, um, Crazy Horse, uh, Best Small Fictions, Lit Hub, um, The Rumpus. And I've won, you know, quite a few prizes uh, for short fiction over the years. And um, I live in Little Rock, Arkansas, where I'm from, with my wonderful husband and some imaginary friends. That's pretty much how my bio reads. So, uh, so yeah, these, the, the story is, uh, the collection is fairly eclectic, um, darkly comic, um, many are speculative. Um, but I'm going to read tonight a short piece for you all, uh, and then I'll turn the floor over to Jenny to read a short, a short bit of Each of Us Killers, I hope. Um, I'm gonna read a uh, short uh, flash. Well, it's a little longer than flash, but it's, it's pretty much flash. And this piece is entitled, Well-Built Men, 18 to 30, Who Would Like to Be Eaten by Me. And this, this, this piece won, uh, let's see, the, um, it won the blue, it won a, uh, the blue, oof, I'm forgetting the, the name of the journal. It won a flash fiction contest from a wonderful journal out of a school, out of an MFA program in um, Montana that is escaping me at the moment. I think in like 2014 is when this story came out initially. So yeah, well-built men, 18 to 30, who would like to be eaten by me. You find it in, you find it in Tristan's room an ad excised from the personals, folded in even thirds, tucked into a collection of South American folk tales. The book was a gift from Tristan's first boss, the Capitan of a Bolivian crew that once cleaned his father's law office. 
Tristan was 19 then, the youngest of four boys, a rising college sophomore home for summer break, and you thought the janitorial job beneath him. But when you pointed this out to Dean, who'd not yet left you for his 20-year-old paralegal, who'd not yet discovered that within his colon, a malignant mass was marshalling its fatal forces, your then-husband seized your slight shoulders. You've got to face facts, Connie, he said. The boy's never been right. It was true that Tristan was always unnaturally attached, that unlike his brothers who blazed trails toward wives, children, careers in periodontal care and hunger relief, Tristan always clung to you, hid in your shadows. He was the only one to show interest in your former life as a human oddity, a contortionist known on the southeastern carnival circuit as collapsible Connie. Your, spe your specialty was dislocating your shoulders, folding your limbs, knitting up your bones into an impossible rectangle of humanity, one small enough to stuff inside a lockbox. You learned the secrets of escaping such a prison from your Uncle Mesmer, a tiny man who sprang from the heart of the Bolivian rainforest, spawned by the chieftain of a purportedly anthropophagous tribe. When you were 12, Mesmer was devoured by a docile lion named Daphne, and for years afterward, when no one was looking, you would sneak off to Daphne's cage pry open her colossal jaws, lay your head against the rough pillow of her tongue. Go on, you would whisper, take me too. But you received in response only a humming purr. Tristan was the only person to whom you revealed this, the only person to whom you admitted that, at zoos, you never stopped jealously eyeing the raw meat fed to big cats. From the moment you first held your youngest, you understood that he'd inherited your flexibility and you taught him everything you know about contortion, about compliance. Seven years after Tristan received his BA in anthropology, Dean was consumed by cancer. And since your ex-husband never got around to marrying his poor paralegal, his money went to your sons. You and Tristan pooled your resources and on the 28th anniversary of his birth, put down a deposit on this craftsman bungalow. Three days ago, your son departed for an overnight camping trip and he hasn't returned. When you invade the sanctity of his room, you discover the personal ad and your eyes feast on the unnatural words. You think of Shirley Loomis, who once informed you that while spending the night at her house, your 10 year old son begged her boy Jimmy to eat him. Please, Tristan said, swallow my flesh. You never mentioned this to Dean. Even you and Tristan never discussed your shared desire to be ingested, to escape this mortal cage via esophagus, stomach, intestines. And now, rather than calling the police, you find yourself collapsing, folding your limbs, knitting up your bones. You cower on the carpet, the slightest version of yourself, wondering when Tristan emerged from your shadows, at what point you crawled into his. I, I love that last image. I mean, it just stays with you. I remember when I read, well, that was one of the first stories I read because the title, I mean, you can't help it. You just have to go to that story. So thank you. That was beautiful. Yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> so. Okay, so I'll introduce myself too. Uh, for those who may not know, I'm Jenny Bart, and uh, this is also my debut collection that you see right there on the screen. Um, and we, I think our books came out about the same time, right, Jen? Because yes, yes, I, I, yeah, you, you, so. you just had your one month birthday, and I just had mine yesterday. So mine was the yeah. second, right? And yours right, was the, right. the eighth, the eighth, maybe. yeah. The eighth. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so that's kind of how we got to know each other, I think, because we kind of, you know, were in, on social media about the same time. Um, and, you know, J Jen's book is kind of more speculative fiction, and I have some of that in my stories, but mine are more, I would say, 
because of the theme of they're all focused around work. And that's one of the reasons I was also drawn to Jen, because I, I remember reading somewhere in one of your bios or someplace online, how you've had a lot of different jobs like me. Yes. Yes. And so anyway, so we'll talk a little bit about that. But, you know, um, yeah, both of us, these are debut collections. And um, I, like Jen, I also had several of these stories published in various online uh, magazines, whether they were university journals or, or otherwise. And um, some of them were finalists for different awards. Um, I don't think I actually won any award necessarily, but I'm very bad about putting myself out there for awards anyway. Yeah. Uh, I keep being told about that. But anyways, <laughs> so um, I'll do a very, really quick read as well, and then we can get into a conversation. Um, and I'm thinking of reading from uh, a, a story that um, it's called The Waiting. And this one did, it got to the finalist stage of the Best of the Net anthology. It was published by Lunch Ticket, which is out of the, um, I think, uh, out of LA, Antioch um, MFA program. So, uh, oh, I need my reading glasses. Sorry, getting old. So let's. <laughs> That's something else we're going to talk about. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Um, exactly. Okay, so I'll just read a couple pages. The Waiting. My last living memory is of my husband carrying my half conscious body away from the thick heat and clinging wetness of the rice field. Something has bitten my right heel, leaving a crescent of bloody marks. He places me on our cart, jumps on, and prods Sucky, our cow, into a jingling trot. Sweat and tears mingle with dust, drawing near black streaks down his cheeks. For one whole day after I die, he sits by my body. At night, he lays down beside it. When some street dogs wander in because of the smell and start howling as though in sorrow, the neighbors come. By now, rats have bitten chunks off my toes and fingers, and flies are feasting on what is left. They clear the animals out with kicks and shouts. The tallest man, our village serpent, bends over and gives my husband a few short slaps. Your wife is dead. You hear me? You understand? Kumarba is no more. My husband opens his mouth in a soundless response. Nobody asks about what happened. A few of them had seen him bring me home, blood foaming from my gaping lips. News of the dying and death get around, gets around quicker than anything in our village. They take my stiff, soiled body for the final rites. Him they take to the city hospital. Two men grab, grab him by his armpits and drag him between them like he's some drunk. The Sarpanch waves everyone away as the lines on his face grow sharper and deeper. Like the nearby village leaders, he has, no doubt, bigger concerns. The fear of another drought season even as water continues to be scarce and the dam repair work goes far too slow. My husband wanders back a day later. Saki had been left tied inside our shed, a small, cool shelter. He brings her out and ties her to the lone limdo tree, putting a bucket of stale water and a pile of chaff within her reach. He squats under the tree in a watchful silence. Thin shoulders curve over his knees, eyes wide and wild like a rabid dog's, an old fragment of yellowed cloth covering his white hair. Though it is time for the monsoons, the sun is as bright as in midsummer. Spears of scorching light escape through the tree's almost bare branches and fall relentlessly on him. The serpent's wife comes by to leave bits of food and a can of water from the daily tanker. She, who had only ever given me dagger looks, begins this daily silent charity toward my husband. He eats without knowing, 
even trying to chew a piece of tire rubber before spitting it aside. As for the water, he pours half the can into Saki's bucket and barely remembers to drink the rest himself. At dusk, he hangs a flickering kerosene lamp from a tree branch and continues sitting till the shadows get long enough to go inside. Lying on the thin, worn mattress, he does not sleep, as if waiting for morning to start his vigil again. A few days pass like this. From a distance, my husband may seem a wise yogi meditating under that limbo. On closer view, his dimmed eyes and the constant mumbling and dribbling mouth tell a different story. The heat gets worse, though a wind rises weakly once or twice a day, tossing dry leaves, old newspapers, and empty plastic bags around him. All this waiting. For what? I do not know. To entertain myself, I fly with the birds, leading them to their favorite tree branches. I play with the ants and insects, crawling into their little crevices and homes. I sit on Saki, whose tail swishes rapidly as if a thousand flies have descended on her. The villagers begin calling him Gaman Kelo, then just Kelo. Schoolboys twirl their fingers near their temples as they spit out the word. He simply looks away. Sometimes he throws stones, clumps of soil, twigs, whatever is in reach, if, someone, if anyone comes close. Not that many do, for he is still wearing those rat-bitten clothes, and he reeks like something dug up from a dry riverbed. One boy is more vicious than the rest. He lopes over like some big film villain and lands a kick on my husband's face, sending him sprawling sideways. When the old man stays motionless after falling, the boy runs. His friends, following him, yell a count in English they must have been learning in school. One, two, three, eight, nine, ten. Some numbers I want them to know. Fifty, the age of the man they knocked over. Fifteen, my age, when I met him as a child bride. Twenty-five, the number of years I had been his wife. 50,000, the amount we had gotten for our farmland to pay for my sick parents' hospital bills. Two, the count of bottles of rat poison we had bought to end our constant worries about work and money. One, the only time I had been pregnant and he had gone from the happiest to the saddest man I had ever known. <laughs> That's, sorry, it was a bit depressing, but. Oh, no, no, it's good. Yeah, no, I, I know I was like, for these kinds of events, I'm like, should I try to find something upbeat in this? Right. It's not really my, that's not really my, my territory, but no, that, see, in that story, I love, I loved, and I was, you know, one of my, you know, I don't know if you, but one of my, um, you know, you mentioned that my, my stories were more speculative, but you have, I mean, there are, there are some stories in this book that are undeniably high concept, speculative, you know, two, no, no fewer than two that are, whose protagonists are, are, are deceased, you know, which is just, yeah. which is just, you know, such a bold and bold move that I, that I love, you know, so that story definitely, you know, yeah. that story definitely spoke to me, but I guess it, it, do you mind, like this, this leads us into a question that I had for you, which was mm -hmm. a lot of people, sh um, a lot of writers, you know, shy away from mixing. I, I am, I, I as a reader love variety. I love mm. variety. Many readers like continuity and for the stories to all be very much like each other. Mm. Um, and you, you know, you go from in this collection, you, you veer from the pretty high concept of, you know, speaking from beyond a narrator speaking from beyond the, beyond the grave to sort of more quiet character focused pieces like, um, mangoes which which isn't yeah. necessarily that quiet but or like right. the story pros and cons or the story about the baker yeah. which mm -hmm. was, um and uh, i wondered i mostly do uh i also you know um all my stories play with reality in some mm -hmm. way mm -hmm. um 
Okay. Um, and uh, I wondered, you know, do you, are you more comfortable in one or the other of those modes? And um, uh, how do you know when a story wants to be sort of one thing or the other? Yeah, no, great question. So, I, I mean, I love the speculative mode. I love to read um, stories like yours more, collections, entire collections like yours. I think with, because also a lot of my writing is inspired by, you know, Indian uh, folklore and folk tale traditions and in those they don't even call it speculative it's just a given you can have a story and suddenly a ghost will be wandering by doing things and they're a minor character in the story they're just a ghost who comes and does something and says something and goes away and yeah. so in, in, you know in India folk tales it was just a given we didn't even think it was anything out of the ordinary to have a ghost tell a story yeah. have a story within a story where you know ghost is telling it you know a dead person so I, I grew up with that so for me it wasn't anything unusual but when I started to take writing workshops you know in the US and I would write something like that at first and, and I'm talking you know I'm talking early 2000s when I was doing my workshops right okay. and I don't think there were a lot of people of color especially not in the weekend and evening workshops that I was taking mm -hmm. and so I would get these really weird looks like what is this what is she writing about you know right. anyways but to your point i'm i think i'm comfortable in both i would love to write more speculative to be quite honest yeah but a lot of the stories here that have gone into straight realism for example uh, social realism like mango season were because of things that were keeping me up at night at the time and so I didn't have any design that said, oh, I'm going to make this collection. You know, so some people have said this, oh, this collection is formally diverse. And that's, that was never my intention. I didn't even plan it as a collection, right? You know how it is. You write a short story, you send it to a journal, they may publish it or not. And so I was just writing stories as they came to me or as I felt, okay, this is something that's keeping me up at night. I want to write about this. Or I would feel like, I can't tell the story from any other point of view. So I'm going to tell it from this dead person's point of view. I don't know how else to do it, to be quite honest. That was a story, yeah, yeah. that particular one, the waiting, you know, um, I was trying to subvert one of the literary traditions in Gujarati folklore, where usually what happens is the ghost or the dead person's entire role in the story is just to help the main character with their unfinished business, whatever that may be, right? right? And you never really get to know about, but what about that dead person? I mean, they're in this limbo world and what about them? What are they going through? Right. And so I thought, well, you know, I want to explore that. And so yeah. that's yeah. kind of where that came from. So, um, yeah, so for me, it's usually about, I want to explore something that I haven't fully understood or that is bothering me or keeping me up at night. And then I just figure out what's the best way to explore it. Okay. so yeah that's really where yeah there's no grand design or anything but yeah that's how it well, comes I think that's great and I think that coming from like it is it is really formally diverse and as someone who has you know studied creative writing extensively in graduate school you know coming to this collection the first thing that someone like me is like oh wow look at this second person coming right out of the gate with this you know I'm, I'm very much like that's that's how I'm trained you know I'm trained right. to to, you know, I, I, this is what I see. This is so formally diverse and it's exactly what I love. But I think that, I think that it's, it's coming for, with you, it's coming from a place of just natural. And, and I also, I started writing in total isolation. When I first started writing, I didn't take a writing class until I was mm -hmm. 34. I hadn't, mm -hmm. no, until I was 32. Yeah. I had been writing on my own for a couple of years and someone was like, hey, why don't you try taking a writing class? And I was like, as though I could let people read my work. You know, it was like such a, like for me to walk into that class, I had like, I almost passed out the first time mm -hmm. that I had to um, read to my classmates in my very first writing workshop. I really literally had a, you know, almost fell. They were like, are you going to be okay? <laughs> I like, I a lot of anxiety, but I started writing in a total vacuum and I did whatever I wanted. So mm -hmm. that when I came to the, when I came to my MFA program, I was like, Hey, and I was already really well formed and they were like, what are you doing? And I was like, whatever I want to do, you know? So, who, you know, what do you, you know? Yeah. So I think that that, I think that the more you study writing formally, the harder it is to listen to yourself, the more voices begin to crowd in from workshop and from people, other writers that, and not, I'm saying, I, I have learned the most 
from reading well-written work and from yes. working my ass off of my stories. That's what I've learned the most from, not from any class I ever took or any teacher I ever had. They've all been wonderful, yeah. but it's really, it's a, it's a self-driven, writing is a self-driven endeavor. And I think that having that space when you're forming to come up with your own ideas, I think it really enriches your work. And I see that in, in this book. So it's, it's for me, and you didn't even know that you were being so like, but each story, it's like, wow, second person. Now we have, you know, and we have to talk about Return to India, which I was yeah. immediately, because I'm a big fan of Kurosawa. And also I just, yeah. last year I taught uh, the story, you know, the, the In a Grove, um, you know, and, oh, and yeah. I was like, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, well, and that was, yeah, so to your point, but, you know, we'll, we'll get to Return to India, but I want to mention your point about the formal, you know, that the people are saying that the, the diversity, I found your collection very diverse too. Yes, there was speculative, but I thought, what, what I thought was you also played a lot, you know, with different points of view. And I mean, for example, you know, of course the title story, I, I loved that. And, but you know, even just like a short thing, like the one right before the title story, was it Dear Dolores? right? Yes. I mean, that's Dear a really short piece. And, you know, you've done it as like a, a letter form, you know, the epistolary. Yeah. And you're thinking, okay, you know, because I've done one of those in mine. And I was like, okay, I want to see. Yeah, I was like, I want to see where that goes. And so you've got this, you know, this person is writing a letter. Okay, I won't give too much away, but this person is writing a letter to Dolores, and it's Dear Dolores. And then, you know, as this as the letter progresses, we, we learn the story through that letter. But what I loved about what you did there is you didn't give us you know what some people do they'll try to give us too much exposition in the letter yeah. and I think you avoided that but you did it in a way that was very skillful because I could still fill in the pieces and fill in the blanks that I could figure out what was going on without you needing to put too much explanation and I, I was thinking that I just as a writer myself I was thinking man that must have taken a lot of self-control just in the process of writing or even a lot of editing you must have edited things out to say, you know, I'm because you pared it down. It was so minimalist, but yeah. it was so powerful. And yeah. so I think your collection is also formally diverse. And then you're also experimenting with a lot of things. And that's what I loved about it. Yeah. 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 That's my, I mean, you know, it, it, that's, as I say, I, I you know, um, you know, that's, that's where I've always been the most comfortable. When I arrived at, you know, my MFA, they were like, so what do you write? And I was like, fiction, you know, and they're like, but you have to, so for me to classify, classification is something that I, I, I have trouble with because I, like you, I see, and you know, I'm also, I love a lot of world literature that does that, you know, a lot of yeah. Latin literature does that, a yes. lot of Asian literature does this, the, or, you know, not, not South Asian, but, but uh, yeah, Asian, Asian, East Asian, mm -hmm. East Asian, sorry, um, you know, has, is very comfortable with the supernatural just wandering through, you know, it's like, oh, it, it, right. and, I, and I've also always loved, you know, a, that, that kind of thing. And also, and I have to say too, your letter, the letter is so, your, the letter in your book, when I came to that, I was like, oh, wow, this is, can, and also, you know, if we, um, you know, and I don't, I don't want to give anything away, I thought, the story Each of Us Killers is one mm -hmm. of the best stories that I've read. I mean, you, you definitely, it's placement in the collection. I think that I liked the way that you ordered the stories. I think you did a really nice job. And what's, what's another funny, strange coincidence, my, uh, my collection was originally titled for the, the collective point of view story, Sometimes They Kill Each Other, the opening story. Yeah. That was the original title of this collection. And it was at the end of the story. So I mm -hmm. also had a collective we perspective story at the end. Yes. And that was the title that I wanted on the book. Right. But it was too violent for, you know, they were like, it's, it's, I, we don't want that. And I was like, ah, you know, and, and yeah. I, well, you know, I what, what's, this, but, yeah, no, I, I would have loved that story uh, as the title. But you know, what's funny in my case, my title was originally pros and cons um, and my editor she's like that sounds like a non-fiction cookbook that sounds yeah. very boring and she was the one who said let's use each of us killers as the title and i was like oh my god no people are gonna think it's violent people are gonna <laughs> so i in my case it was the opposite i was the one pulling back yeah, yeah. I was all like no 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 and then she was like no i think that's the one to go with and um you know that story was published by quality journal and laura pegram who's the um editor there she gave me such good feedback on that story just because I don't think the story changed like drastically or anything from when I sent it to her, but just there were so little things where she said, okay, this, you know, because of the collective point of view, what you said, it's not an easy point of view to pull off. People no. think, yeah, because you know, you have to, it's like, 
you can only show things or you know that the whole group can see right. and that's very tricky for you to really understand what can i show here through this point of view and what can i not show right. and so i had a couple of things in my initial draft that i had sent her where i had some things where she came back to me and she said i don't think that this particular group would see what you have shown me you're going to have to tell that part of the story some different way Mm, you know yeah. and um and and she also had me remove i remember i had um you know the story has maybe three three main characters speaking characters yeah. that are separate from the group i actually had five maybe five or six and she said no too many voices too many. if yeah. you want that collective voice to have the power that it needs to have take out two voices yeah i mean that was just amazing feedback you know because a lot of editors don't go to that length don't read that closely yeah. and she read that closely and she was able to articulate to me exactly why uh -huh. those two you know I, i needed to keep only two or three speaking voices and take the rest out i'm just so indebted to her because that story did go on to be nominated for you know best uh, american short stories or whatever but yeah i think so i wanted to ch uh, talk to you about you know you've talked about how you've published a, a lot of these stories in journals and i wanted to ask you uh, because people ask me this all the time what has you been your um experience with uh literary journal editors and was there any story of yours in the collection where you felt like that story would not be what it is without that particular editor you know like 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 my example let's say yeah you know i have not my i have not had i am a perfectionist and a complete freak of nature mm -hmm. so my stories don't leave my care until they are done oh. so i have actually never had extensive edits to a story mm -hmm. that i've published mm -hmm. um i am well, the the one that was the most extensive that i've done i i wasn't Uh, I I didn't really agree with some of the edits that I made but I made them to please the journal because it was a big journal so I I don't really want to look at work Yeah sure sure I don't really want to talk about that but other than that and to be honest I think my original version of the story was still the better version of the story but um I'm I'm a I'm a I'm a real control like I, I think that a lot of writers are like this I mean the reason that we one of the reasons we write is because we we what else you know especially I think a lot yeah. of It, it, it's it's a especially for someone who grew up in a in maybe a, a situation where you didn't have much control and things were kind of scary and weird. I mean, you have this like uh, this real desire to control things. So yeah. my work is really like uh, no one else is. I I have a really hard time letting other people in. I'm mm -hmm. like a closed system in that way. That's why like when I arrived at my writing classes, I was just like. When I got to my program, they were like, okay, you're, you know, I was already doing, because I just, that, that's the way, that's just the way that I am. I'm like right, this right. very strange. No, but, I mean, that's great. Yeah. No, that's great. I mean, that, that says that you've got that certain level of confidence. In my case, I think what happened was, because I was writing about worlds that were maybe not as commonly read about here, right? Back in the okay. early 2000s. And so I had, first of all, I lacked confidence. I was an engineer taking these classes on the side, you know, yeah. and so I didn't have the confidence. And so when people would tell me, oh, that doesn't make any sense, you should change it. I'd be like, oh, yeah, okay, I'll change it, you yeah. know. And so a lot of trial and error on my part. But um, yeah. when I did well, get feedback that, I, that, that really worked for me, like Laura, yeah. that, that was to me like, okay, that is good. Yeah. Um, but coming, coming to Return to India, the story that you mentioned, with, that story wasn't published anywhere. Yeah. Okay, and because it was too long, usually, as you know, a lot of literary journals, the short stories they ask for, they usually have a word count limit, right? It's maximum yeah. about five thousand, very yeah. few take less, and the story is longer. Yeah. And so, um, what had happened to your point was um, about how I used the kind of the Kurosawa Rashomon sort of thing yeah. was. Um, it's actually based on a real life incident, first of all. So there was okay. an Indian uh, tech um, engineer. In 2017, in Kansas, right, in and he worked for Motorola, and he walked into a bar one Friday evening with a friend, and um, both of them Indian, and there was this guy sitting behind the bar, or sitting at the bar, I should say, not behind the bar, at the bar, an older guy, a vet, you know, and he thought they were Middle Eastern, and yeah. he just takes out a gun and starts, you know, firing it, wow. and that's how this person died. 
Now, what happened though, I was in India at the time. I had gone back to, do, to work on some writing projects and I was watching it all sort of unfold on CNN and BBC and everything, right? Right. And what they were doing was they were interviewing, uh, obviously they were interviewing his wife, but she was like, she was always breaking down every time they got to, the cameras got on her because she was at that point, right? She hadn't digested all of this. But then, so they would turn to the camera and, and the mic to his coworkers, right? Mm -hmm. And most of them were white because they were talking, you know, a little town in Kansas. And what, ha what I noticed, what was very interesting to me, and I'd been out of the U.S. for a while. I'd, obviously, I'd, I'd lived in the U.S., worked in the U.S. a long time, and then I'd gone back to India for a few years to work on some writing projects. And I was looking at all of this now from a slightly different perspective of not physically being in the U.S. while it was happening. And I was watching how each one was sharing their point of view of who this engineer was and how it had been for them to work with him. Right. They all knew intellectually that he was there on a work permit, but none of them seemed to really grasp, and I'm not blaming them, it's that they haven't had that experience, but none of them seemed to grasp what a tenuous situation he and his wife had been in. Because when you're on a work permit, and I had been on one a while years ago myself, there are things you can and cannot do. You don't have the same rights and privileges as your white counterparts. You can only work in the job that you were hired to do. You can't take promotions. You can't move cities. Uh -huh. uh, if you're planning to get a mortgage and have a family, which he and his wife had been talking about, those are even bigger decisions for you because you don't know if your work permit goes, you have to like leave the country, right? And so yeah. there was a lot of these things that they did not even think about. And it sounded like they didn't know. Right. And so when I initially started to write the story, first I wanted to write it from the ex-wife's point of view. Mm -hmm. You know, they, the character was divorced and I wanted to write it from the ex-wife's point of view, but I felt like I wasn't conveying all of these things that I had seen and heard in those co-worker interviews. And so then I thought, you know what, I'm just gonna do it as co-worker interviews. Yeah. But rather than have a journalist, which is what I've done in Each of Us Killers, right. I had a police officer. Yeah. I wanted to like give these, you know, it was like, you know, if you're looking through a kaleidoscope and yeah. you're just doing a little shift each time with each character. So yeah. the, the, the pattern changes just a little bit, but then you see more of it each time. Yeah, it changes just a little bit. So I, that's what I was hoping to go for. And yeah, so. well, I mean, it's such an original. I mean, it's it's such an original approach for a piece of short fiction. Mm -hmm. Aside from Inner Grove, I mean, that you know, that's my yeah. that's the only. I can't think of anyone that I know of who does experimentals, and they're probably probably Michael Martone. There's probably people who have done this, but I've not seen anyone. No, I've not come across a story, and it's just. I mean, what an innovative way to introduce a character, and it it just reinforces how uh, it reinforces how unknown he was and everything you're saying the things the things that people did not know about him and he 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 only sort of half emerges as a character and you know that to me echoes you know it echoes you know um the 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 sense of you know knowing and i this is one of the things that i obsessively write about mm -hmm. the difficulty of actually knowing anyone else i am obs you know for whatever reason that just comes out in everything i write and so for me that also really nicely um like what an innovative way to present him and what a what a creative exercise for you to get to switch the voice from character to character and i love but i love that analogy of the of the the you know the turn each turn yeah. giving you a little bit more of him that was I, yeah. I thought that was i mean what a bold and innovative way to open well, I mean, and I, and, yeah and to your point i mean i'm not thinking that way i'm just like okay how do i do this you you know you know when you're when you're in the middle of a story you're not thinking yeah oh, I'll do this and it's going to be bold. You're thinking, how is, is this working? How can I make it work to do what I want it to do? Right. And, you know, but to your point about getting to know a character, that reminded me of one of your stories. And this one is, um, I, I, I'm bad with titles, but it's the one with Rita and the monster. Ah, uh, yes. It's Come Back Rita. Come Back Rita. Come back, so Rita. with that one, yeah, what I loved about that, that was, you know, you've got these lines about how we are each other's monsters, you know, and you've got, you know, Rita and Frank. And, and I thought that was a beautiful way where you had, you know, you had these um, two couples, right? Yeah. And yeah. you've got, you know, you're with, 
as the story is progressing, we're getting to know the four characters, but we're also getting to know about their individual relationships. Yeah. And, and, you know, you, we see the relationship from, I mean, it's also the relationship, I think the characters themselves are understanding, like Mickey is understanding his own relationship as the story progresses, right? Yes. That I think is really tricky to pull off because you're yeah. showing, you, you've got a story set in the present time, mm -hmm. things are unfolding. So the characters don't, can't exactly do a lot of, you know, reflection on the past and how things happened, but yet you've managed to do that kind of back and forth, back and forth so that we get a sense of where the characters are today and why they are there today right. at this point in time that you are writing about in that story, the present time story. You've given us just enough so that we can figure out why they are where they are. And I thought yeah. that, you know, that's something I try to, that I'm, I don't know if I'm always successful with that, but I love that story for that reason. Thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's tricky. I mean, um, I think that um, moving between, pre this is a good question. Yeah. This is something that I've been thinking about a lot lately, time, you know, how we handle, this is something that I've thought about, you know, a lot. Moving between, I think that for, for me, people have asked me, how do you handle, how do you think you handle time in fiction? Or what do you think about? And this, I'm interested in this question for you too, but I think that there must always be a sense for me of a present, there must always be a sense if there's a present, there's a past, and there's a future. So I think that in a story, and, and you, you, ha you learn how to balance how much, like you were saying, you cannot bring in too much of the past, particularly in a piece of short fiction. You just don't have the space for it. The readers don't, don't need to know. So it's figuring out like what it is, what are the salient detail, what are the parts that will give you the whole. And I think that that's I mean, for creative writers, I think that's our job our whole life is we are, we are, we are, until we're, you know, 80, we're still trying to find that perfect, that one or two detail image, um, piece of clothing, whatever it is that, that makes, that brings it all, that brings it all into, or, or into life, that makes yeah. the rest of it appear, like pop up. But in all my stories, I think there must be a sense. I don't think that just, there's not, there's not just a present in anyone's life. There must be some sense of a past. And I also always feel this need to push it a little bit into the future to bring in that sense yeah. that there, that there's this continuity of time. I mean, I guess I first, you know, I first came across this maybe when reading Faulkner when I was a teenager, you know, this idea, Faulkner, the idea of time as this, as this unfolding, never ending field in which everything that's happened is still happening and will always be happening. And that's how I think of time. And I think that um, all my stories, I, I, you know, it's, it's, again, a lot of times this isn't conscious, you know, a lot of, most of my work is not conscious. Most of the stories in this book are stories that like you, I sat down and was like, let's solve a problem and write a story mm -hmm. that, that I'm satisfied with. Mm -hmm. Then when you look, it's when you're asked to look back at your work, like I'm, you know, I'm learning so many things, you know, about it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, the, the, um, uh, that is, that is also one of my favorite. I, I love, you know, I love that story. I love all people are like, which one's your favorite? Do you yeah, have it's favorite? hard to pick? <laughs> <laughs> I can't yeah. name a favorite. They're all my children. I, I, I you yeah. know, I like them all, but, um, but yeah. So yeah. do you have a favorite story? No, no, I can't pick one. I mean, <laughs> if I had to, if I did pick one, it would change every day. Yeah. You know, it just depends on your mood. Right. Yeah. So I, I can't pick one, but I will say, you know, people have asked me which ones were, you know, your favorite now. I, I'll, I'll say, I'll rephrase the question. I'll say my, my favorite, really, rather than favorite, it should be which one was the most challenging to write because that one gives us as writers the most satisfaction. Satisfaction, right? yeah. yeah. And, I, and I think that the opening and closing stories, Return to India, and then the title story, Egypt is Killers, those were the most difficult for me because yeah. of the collective points of view and because in both of them, the main characters if you like are not living actors in the story right and so yeah. how do you communicate the sense of a person uh, you mm -hmm. know to your point that i think there's the sense of time as well as the sense of a person but mm -hmm. if the person doesn't even exist in the story they're not speaking they're not they don't have a voice yeah they you can't describe them because they're not even like just lying there dead or anything you know so in both of those stories how do I communicate or convey that sense of this human being that was? Right. And again, to your point, the story is unfolding in the present time. I didn't yeah. want to put in too much of the past. Some of it is there, but not too much.
much. Otherwise, I've started my present time at the wrong time, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And then I like your point about the, the you know you convey a sense of the future because I, I forget who who said this, but I always say this. Um, every you know the ending of every story is the beginning of another one right yes, absolutely. so i always yeah and i always want to end a story so that it sounds like okay this could be the ne the beginning of another story yeah. something i think the know. best stories and you know i think that good with 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 when you have a good story there's another story opening up at the back end yes you know i think that that's absolutely um absolutely true can, can i ask yeah. for about um this each of us killers was that based in any way on on true real events? Yeah, yeah, that I was also, like yeah, it was, yeah. So in 2016, um, while I was in India, there was, you know, so India has a caste system, right? A lot of people yeah. know that. And I was, what, yeah. That was so fascinating, the scavenger, right? That was the scavenger, that, that sort yeah. of deep dive into that group of people. It was just fascinating. Yeah, because I, I actually, so I, I actually went and talked, like I was, uh, to some extent, that journalist in the story because I actually went and spoke to them um, mm -hmm. because I just wanted to, I felt like I would not do justice to, to representing the, this, this, this group of people if I didn't at least meet them and talk to them a little, right? Mm -hmm. I, I felt very uncomfortable just writing about them without having done that. And so mm -hmm. what, what had happened was in, there had been these riots, right? And these scavengers for, for, lower caste you know the Dalit caste um, men had been flogged publicly mm -hmm. and a whatsapp video had been circulated throughout um, you know just gone viral yeah. on social media um, and they'd been flogged by these upper caste people because they had been accused of killing a cow right. for the skin for the leather and mm -hmm. they said oh no we didn't do that it was dead already and nobody was willing to do the work of skinning it and getting it out of the way so we did it so if anything, we should have been thanking them that they took care of this horrible job of right. moving a dead cow, but um, the upper caste men flogged them. And then that resulted in this huge outcry publicly. And, you know, there were riots, there were demonstrations, there were protest marches. Uh, some young Dalit men uh, drank acid and committed suicide in protest. Um, wow. And there was just a whole lot of stuff going on. I mean, the whole state um, shut down. The chief minister had to call a state of emergency. Wow. Yeah, it was pretty bad. And I just wanted to understand. I thought, well, you know, the headlines, there was, it was all over the news. I said, there's enough in the headlines, but we never get beyond what actually happened. And we rarely ever heard from the people whom this was affecting the most, right? right. And I, I wanted to, I wanted to maybe, I wanted to see what was in the silence, what was in what we were not hearing. The, you know what was not in the headlines yes. it's one thing taking something from the headlines and then writing a story about it but you know i wanted to write about what was not in the headlines yes. so you know a lot of india a lot of stuff that happens in india i mean this year alone there have been two uh, very well lauded novels that have been set in india they've been shortlisted nominated for several awards one awards whatever and they the, the writers have said oh yeah we took something that was happening in the headlines and we wrote a story about it and that's great but I feel like you know when you do that you owe something to the people that you are writing about yeah, yeah and I'm not a lower caste person I have class and caste privilege in India so yeah. I want to be very careful when I represent those voices you know yeah so I'm I tend to always be more interested in the story of the powerless i'm always more interested in the story of the marginalized the powerless i i what for whatever reason i have all my life I, I don't know if it's partly because i am someone who's i feel like i've stood on the sidelines for a lot of my life I, i'm not an active participant in a lot of life not not necessarily by choice like when i was growing up i was i was like uh you know like uh, pathologically shy and could not like socially <laughs> deal with stuff. Oh, me too. But, uh, me too. But, <laughs> so, so I, I have always, I, I find um, stories that are narrated from corners and margins and doorways and things like that to be so much more interesting than ever any story about whoever's in the limelight. You know, and that's right. sort of one of my, my, my trademark, I feel like it's one of my trademark um, uh, notions is that I'm always going to look at it. I I work indirectly, and I think that for me, 
the, one of the reasons that I think I'm so drawn to speculative fiction, A, because I love it, because I've always loved the idea that something could happen that we can't explain. Right. And if, I mean, if we're going to be honest, we can't explain anything, but you know, that's a whole nother. Yeah, you know, we, this year, especially Jen, yeah. there is not a lot we can explain. <laughs> no, but even, yeah. even overall, like, man, we are, we are, we are an animal that needs answers and there really aren't any, we make them up, you know, so we create a world and we live in it and that's fine. And we can answer our own questions. But, um, but for me, I, I am someone who always wanted for there to be something else. I've never experienced anything else, never had a, any kind of supernatural experience, never heard a voice, never saw a ghost, nothing, you know? And I'm like, hello. Um, but, but, you know, it's not like I'm some ghost hunter, but I just mean, that's always, especially as a child, I was so taken with the idea of magic. But I also mm. think that as a writer, for me, as a writer of literary fiction, we, because I deal, because I've dealt with a lot of really heavy things in my life, you know, a lot of, a lot of, and I think that if you're going to write about human beings, for me, the kind of writer that I am, I can get at closer, I can get closer to truth, whatever that may be, when I move indirectly and in some way that is not the way that everybody else is moving at yes. it. I, I can get yes. somewhere writing in the way that I write, that if I just sat down and was like, there, you know, if I wrote just a straight ahead here, you know, a story about, you know, these characters doing things and there was no looking askance or sort of a slant at what was happening, it wouldn't get as close to some sort of universal truth for me, I don't think. Right. And that's, right. that's one reason that I think I'm more, that, that I just always, everything that I've written, I've tried to sit down and write domestic realism oh, many, many times, you know, and it just, it, it doesn't, doesn't work. Yeah come and it does you know so, so there's always some element of that and for me it, it enriches it enriches because because all my stories are about what everybody's stories are about human beings and relationships and working our lives and working you know they're about the yeah. same things but they just take it they look at them differently and that i think is is the way that i work as a writer and I, yeah, yeah and i and i love that that's why i mean in fact my next project is mostly speculative i would say it's not realism it's not a lot of realism because i i exactly to your point you can get to certain truths or certain answers better if you go a different way yeah because you know we've got enough sensationalism and drama in our daily news and daily headlines yeah. and we're none the wiser for it right right yeah. and so to your point i would much rather go behind the headlines i would much rather approach it differently whether it's through speculative fiction or it's a different point of view or it's a different structure of the story, you know, but yeah. go, go at it differently. Yes. Yeah. And I think that's, I mean, you know, we've, yeah, like you said, we've, do, we've, we've done it the same way for a long time, you know, and I think trying, trying, um, trying these new approaches will just enrich, you know, yes. our knowledge of ourselves and our world. So yes. I'm glad you agree, Jenny. Yes. <laughs> Hmm. Okay, Tom's back. You're on mute. Yeah. I didn't want to interrupt, guys. I've really no. enjoyed this conversation that we've had here. I want us to give uh, a little bit of an opportunity to our audience. Folks, if you've got questions, drop them in our comment section below, and we can direct them to our authors. That way we can get your questions answered and have a great time. I will note there's a brief period here, so if you've got questions, drop them now. I will say, Jenny and Jen, I am fascinated by the short story format because it's always something that, as it's very difficult to pull off, especially like you said, in that 5,000 words or shorter or longer. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very close, tight knit format and, you know, conveying a message and sort of having a denouement at the end of it is still something that's very difficult to do in that short period. So I'm very impressed you both do that, mm -hmm. which leads to my question, which is, what do you both want people to take away from your books? Are they supposed to have sort of a collective theme or thought that comes from them? Or is it the reading enjoyment of them? And I was hoping you could both could speak to that just a little bit. Okay. Do you want to go, Jen? Sure. Well, in my case, I mean, the, the collection is organized around a theme. So the stories are all organized around, you know, work and our emotional lives and how we even in our working life, um, you know, we spend a lot of time in working wake, of our waking hours at work and in our working lives, how, you know, we're navigating class and gender and, and you know, caste in, in India, especially, and all of those isms that we talk about, we navigate those at work all the time too. And sometimes it's, it's more overt and sometimes it's, you know, covert. 
And so the collection is really about that. And so what I would love is for somebody who reads the collection is to maybe, you know, go back the next day to their own workplace and maybe see things a little differently in their own interactions with people. I think if they, if, if they get a new sensitivity and new awareness of how they themselves or other people at their workplace are navigating those fault lines, then I think that'd be great. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> that's good. Yeah, oh, well, and to, uh, to answer the same question, and yes, um, I think that work stories, you know, have a universal appeal because human beings spend the majority of their lives working. It's, it's what we're taught to do. It's what we're, you know, this is what is modeled for us by our forebears and we work. So I think that working stories are always wonderful. Um, and, but with, with, uh, with Mannequin and Wife, with my book, it's, it, this book was not organized around a theme. I have another book coming out um, that is in which each of the stories uh, uh, reimagines the story of a different popular literary villain so from various, there's Shakespearean villains, nice. there's fairy tale, fairy tale, Medusa, um, Captain Hook. Um, so that book, that's that. But this is this. The, what I think that what links, um, what links the stories in Mannequin and Wife. Each of the stories has at its heart a central pairing that is one of our most essential relationships: husband and wife, uh, mother and child, siblings, mentor and protege. Um, I think that what I'm in a, in a roundabout speculative way, sort of like Jenny and I were talking about, what I'm bearing down on, what I want people to see is themselves in, in a way that they haven't seen themselves before. That's kind of all of my work. What I'd like to do is show everybody what, what, what's right in front of us, but we're not seeing. Mm -hmm. that, I see that as kind of my overarching literary project. I want, because there is so much that we have become desensitized to, things like, I mean, I'm sure the caste system in India, human suffering, you know, how beautiful the clouds are when they press against the, you know, as though there's a piece of glass. I mean, all, all these things that we, um, there are things that we encounter every day and do not see. And I would like to try in some small way to let, to let, to, um, to build a sort of a ramp for someone else to see something that they know, but has been sort of veiled from them. Mm -hmm. I guess that's my project <laughs> in a way. I love that's that great. And I love the sound of your next one. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, so, yeah. So. We are almost out of time here. I've really loved our discussion. I wanted to ask both of you just sort of as a last final question, any final thoughts you might have on releasing a book during a pandemic? Ah, yes. <laughs> Do you want to go? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll let you go first this time. Well, since we're both, you know, we're both, this is our debut, like we have nothing to compare it to, right? And I actually haven't, you know, even though I've been around writers for many years because I've been in grad programs, I've never talked to someone. Mm -hmm. Okay. What, say hi. No, Are they there? No. Oh, uh, sorry. I hadn't. Um, I haven't ever. Uh, I haven't ever really talked, sat down, and talked to a writer about the process of having a debut book come out. So it has been. But but I would say that what I found from talking to other people, the biggest challenge is this very. A lot of what, particularly um, small press books, a lot of um, you know, mark moving the books is about in-person um, events where you get to be face to face with the writer and you get to connect with them and you sell books by hand and there's a lot of this and the, you know the pandemic has just wiped that out but I have to say that booksellers like in Terabang and other booksellers that I've been working with here in Little Rock where I live there's a wonderful independent bookstore called Wordsworth and books um, mm -hmm. have stepped up mightily to the plate and to help uh, you know particularly small press debut authors like me and Jenny um, and so you know I, I just um, we owe a huge debt. We already did, but to booksellers who are who are providing us with these online formats. And without it, I don't know where we'd be. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean, to your point, yeah, we don't have much to compare with because we're debut authors. And, you know, I've got um, two books coming out this year. I've got another one which is coming out in India, which is a translation. And so I don't even, I was initially planning to go to India to launch that one, but of course that's not happening now. But, um, I think Jen's absolutely right. I, I kind of intellectually knew that launching a book in general takes a village, right? I mean, there's book reviews, there's interviews, there's book events, there's so much that has to happen around a book launch for the book to be out in the world. 
you know, where you, you go from this solitary process of writing it to this process where you're suddenly thrust in and constantly, you know, there's like five, six, 10 emails a day with people, right? Yes. To get this book out from the, its writer to its readers. And I think the pandemic has just tossed everything, you know, turned it all upside down because yeah. whatever was the normal way of doing business to get a book launched is out the window. And I know that bookstores like in Terabang and, and you know, so the others that I've worked with in, in my own uh, book events, you know, the work that you guys are doing is like almost like yeoman's work because I know there's not as much in terms of sales coming through. We all know this, you know, yeah. because there's no buy button on Zoom that you can just make people click, right? It's not like hand selling. It's not like a, a real live flesh and blood, you know, when it's, you know, it's not like, you know, you're not pressing hands and you're not like handing yeah. things to people kissing babies I, yeah kissing babies and pressing flesh right so i mean i know that that isn't happening and and so it's tough i think it's such a tough time plus it's an election year i mean it was i already knew about the election year coming in so you got the election year you've got the pandemic and who knows what else might happen the year isn't done yet so yeah. i'm just very grateful and thankful for the book being out I'm just, just, you know, I'm just grateful for every little mercy, every little thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I will say that uh, there have been people who've suddenly shown up that I didn't even know existed and they've suddenly popped up and started supporting the book. And I am just endlessly, we, Jen and I, we were talking about that before the recording started. There are people we don't even know who are out there supporting our books. Yeah. And we just, I can't even get my head around that. So I just love that part of how the pandemic has brought people together. Yeah, it's wonderful. It is, it is. I mean, it, it's, it's challenging, but it's open. It, I think it's opening new avenues for everybody. Hopefully we'll all learn from this mm -hmm. and, uh, and the reach that, that these kind of events gives is it's, you know, you can't touch it. I mean, I've talked, I have talked to, I, I, I've talked to another writer who said books come out and he said, you know, he was saying, um, he was he was talking about how when you, when you travel city to city it's exhausting and only a certain number of people can come to these events but but this is really opening things up um, doing the zoom doing the uh, the virtual events in terms of um, being able to cover a lot of geography uh, in an event and have people come from all over so right. it's, it's it's good it's got its it's it's got its challenges but I think it also uh, you know is moving us in a positive direction so yeah, yeah. thank you for thumbs that. up yeah. Hey, all the way around. Yeah. I'm also a goofball. I'm trying not to be a big goofball tonight. <laughs> Are you Normally, kidding? That makes it memorable a... and fun? We, no, <laughs> no, by now I'd have a lampshade on my head and a weird <laughs> nose on. <laughs> not really. <laughs> That's perfect. Well, thank you both so much for joining us. Thank you to our audience for joining us who makes this in, important work happen. Folks, you should right now go to that link at the top of this post and click on it and buy your copy of Mannequin and Wife and Each of Us Killers. Do it now, support the independent bookstore, support these authors, they've got great works and you should read more of them. I should also yeah, note that so this much recording- Tom. Thank you for course, hosting. It's a pleasure. Here, here. So much, really. And I <laughs> should note that this recording you. will be up at some point in the not so distant future for the folks who weren't able to see the beginning of this or miss an element of it. That should come up on YouTube in a little while. Thank you all so much. Have a lovely and safe evening. Take good care and remember to enjoy reading. Thank yes. Thank you, Interabang. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>